in third and two thirds. They're going to limit the ban, uh, I should say the stay on the ban, to only certain groups. That core group of people who are Americans or current visa holders who intend to come back to the country or intend to leave the country soon, those people are still going to be, uh, this uh, temporary restraining order was still applied for them. Others who are not from these countries, who are, you know, no connection to this country, I think that part should be lifted. But here's the interesting thing. All the Republicans are going to be hoisted by their own petard on this, because if this does go to the Supreme Court, let's say the the uh, TRO, the preliminary injunction, whatever you want to characterize it as, let's say it stays in place, and it goes to the Supreme Court. You're still looking at a split 4-4 court. Do you now delay argument until you can get Neil Gorsuch to become Justice Gorsuch? Or do you wait and get this taken care of immediately? What happens then? It becomes a little bit of a political catch-22. However, I have confidence that whatever does happen, I think ultimately this temporary injunction, TRO, preliminary injunction, whatever you want to call it and however you want to characterize it, I think ultimately it does get denied and everything gets back to the language of the president's executive order and we go from there. A little bit of, you know, calculated uh, political slash legal analysis there. By the time you're listening to this, the decision will most likely be out and you can tell me whether I'm right or wrong. And if I was right, I'm going to say I told you so. And if I was wrong, I was going to say, well, I didn't have all the facts in front of me at the time. Because that's what I do. (laughs) Anyway, folks, uh, got a few minutes left here in the show. Again, Dan Gaynor, newsbusters.org, Media Research Center. They're my go-to guys when it comes to the media hypocrisy, liberal bias, mainstreams, lamestream media nonsense. Check them out on social media, on, you know, the web, every way you can. You know, talk to Dan online if you want to friend him on Facebook, Dan Gaynor, look him up. And uh, listen, it, it, it's always great to have them on. We're going to keep going behind enemy headlines every month, and uh, it's always a, a blast to do that portion of the show, because I love talking about this media bias, and that's going to typify the president's first hundred days in office, is this media treatment that he's getting. Not for nothing, folks. Isn't this supposed to be the honeymoon period for a president, where they get to do all the fun things, they're settling into the Oval Office, they're settling into the White House, they're writing executive office, they're making multi-billion dollar uh, negotiations and deals, they're appointing their cabinet... This has been the most non-honeymoon period I've seen for any president in my lifetime. I mean, when you think about it, folks, Donald Trump right now, as we record this show early in his third week of being in office, has more unconfirmed nominees than the last 11 presidents combined. Yes, that, that, that's, that's what I said. Don't, ask, don't back me up on it. You know, CNN is the one that said it. Check out uh, one of their reports. They actually said that. Could you imagine having to work under those conditions where you get the greatest job in the world, but you can't get your own staff working because people don't want to show up to work. They want to boycott their own jobs. They want to cause a ruckus and and cry and whine and bitch and moan. Could you imagine? That's what we're going through as a nation right now. It's not the right thing that the Democrats are doing here. Not in the slightest. This should be a time where it should be a little bit of a feeling out process. There should be some communication going back and forth. I'll give you a perfect example of what should be happening in D.C. right now. I've been known on social media to go on different friends' websites. I have friends who are liberal, centrist, conservative, uh, anarcho-capitalist, neocon, whatever you want to label them. I, we run the gamut on my uh, my friendship. And I went on to a friend, not a friend, a frenemies page, a political rival and adversary, if you will, here in the People's Republic of New York. And we were talking about the appointment of Betsy DeVos to Secretary of Education. And it's always been my position that the Department of Education should not be a cabinet-level position. It's not constitutional, in my opinion, to have that position there. Uh, I don't think that the government should be meddling in in, uh, creating education policy outside of Congress. I think if you want to allocate money for education and you want to link it to certain policies and certain, you know, promises of policies, Congress can do that with the power of the purse. You do not need a cabinet level position to then make policy. That's just my personal opinion. But I go onto a person's page who happens to be liberal and I start talking about this with them. I start talking about the constitutionality of it. And two types of liberals come on the page. One, 
very smart lawyer, top legal education, and we're discussing, you know, constitutional interpretation, originalist versus the more progressive way of, of reviewing it. And then there's this other person that comes on and says to my liberal friend, why are you engaging with this person? It's just futile. And that's the kind of liberal Democrat that lost this election because they didn't want to engage in a conversation. And you know what, folks? I actually found through my conversation with the other liberal that I had that we had a bit of common ground. The common ground being that we don't believe in each. We disagree on where the line should be drawn, but at least that's a start. We disagree on the role of Congress and whether, you know, the Department of Education should be a cabinet level position. But we agree that there should be some federal interaction with states and who should dominate that discussion, whether it be state or federal, is a matter of disagreement. But at least we talked it out and found a common ground. By this other schmuck of a liberal shutting out the conversation, shutting it down, why are you talking to this guy? It's futile. Could you go away? I actually said to the guy, if you don't want to talk, I'll go away. He's like, yeah, definitely. Good. See you. Bye. By doing that, all you're doing is shutting down not only this discussion and thought, but you're shutting down your own party. Because how are you going to grow? How are you going to get things done with the opposition? Unless you talk it out. See, I'm willing to talk to people. That's what I do for a living. I talk to everybody, as you can see. But when it comes down to it, if you're not willing to even engage or talk because you think you're maybe above the conversation or because you know that there's going to be a quote-unquote fundamental disagreement then nothing's ever going to get done. I'm glad that this gentleman interacted with me, and shame on the other one for failing to do so and refusing to do it and shutting it down. You're the reason why this country's in the state it's in right now and so polarized and divisive. Be willing to talk. Engage outside your, your little bubble, whether it be your social media bubble or your circle of friends bubble. Get out there and interact with people who disagree with you because iron sharpens iron, folks. How are you going to become better at articulating what you're saying? And how are you going to not, how are you going to shut down the learning process for yourself if you don't get out there and mix it up in a productive way with people from the other side? You know what? I'm going to give you guys a homework assignment. I know this is not like me, but here's what I want you to do. Come back next week. Let me know on social media or at www.behindenemylinesradio.us about an interaction you had with someone who doesn't believe in the same political ideology that you do. And explain how that interaction went and see who was open to the experience and who wasn't. I guess that's my final thought for the night. Because right about now, it's time to shut this sucker down. Again, thanks to Dan Gaynor, Media Research Center, and Newsbusters for taking us behind enemy headlines. And thank you guys for listening, whether you're listening to us live, on podcast, on demand, on our rebroadcast outlets, however you're doing it. Thanks for listening to Behind Enemy Lines Radio, live from the People's Republic of New York. But until next week... Time to shut this sucker down. We are out of here. Good night, folks. Our position has been compromised. It's time to roll out. Report for debriefing at www.behindenemylinesradio.us and look for regular communications via Facebook and Twitter at BEL underscore radio. You are the resistance behind enemy lines. A Rock Radio Production. Copyright 2016. Back in seven days. Out.